and I will say a little bit about myself first. I'm Patricia Tomlinson and I'm the Curator of Exhibitions at the Appleton Museum of Art. And we would like to welcome you to our Artist Outlook video series, where I sort of interview and sort of chat various artists that are either in our permanent collection or on view in our museum. And tonight we have a very special artist. I am so thrilled to have her, Sharon Carey Harland. We have a gorgeous piece of her that we'll be showing you and talking about a little later, but I wanted to have her introduce herself. I'm sure most of you know her, but those of you that might want a little more information, I'm gonna go ahead and let her introduce herself. So Sharon, if you could please do that. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here with you, Patricia. Thanks for inviting me. Um, a little background information, how I got um, started in the art world. Um, I actually was introduced to art when I was in uh, high school. I went to uh, private high schools in Louisiana and uh, uh, Ohio, and we were always interested in the visual and the performing arts. So I went to plays, I was in comp art competitions and um, the like. So I always had an interest in art, although I never really wanted to be an artist. I was more interested in being um, an archaeologist. So i um, interested in going to Europe and uh, Egypt and uh, going on architectural digs. So from there, um, that was the main thing that sort of got me interested in um, art. And then my uncle, Marion Sampler, uh, was a artist in um, California. So I was always sort of involved in the art world. He um, uh, taught at um, one of the universities. He had his own studio and um, he uh, did a lot of geometric types of work. His work actually is in the Met. So um, from there, I sort of channeled him really because I taught um, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, I taught um, textiles and from there, I also had a home studio and I do a lot of work that is also geometric. So that, and then my mom was a um, quilter. Um, she did not um, make her own patterns, but she mastered the technique. So I went from there um, and uh, got my uh, degree from Marquette University, but not in um, art. But I took a lot of um, art classes at Myad, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, uh, a lot of black and white photography classes, which um, you can kind of see in my work, the abstract uh, work. So um, basically from that's sort of my background of how I got into uh, the art world and textiles and painting. Marvelous. Thank you for that. The, the archaeology comment was very interesting. I don't know if you know this. I'm a former archaeologist. Oh, really? Yes. And I segued into art history. So we kind of oh. have similar paths. <laughs> Good. Yes. Very fun. Well, thank you for that. And I, we're going to really see, um, I think it's going to become very clear to our visitor, our visitors and our, our viewers that we're going to see that influence of graphic design very clearly in your work mm -hmm. as when we show the slides as we tend to do in the middle of these. But one of the things that I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about, you touched on it a wee bit um, with the influence of your mother and how she was a gifted quilter. But what other influences did you have? Was there a particular artist that you were particularly fond of or could you elaborate a little on that? Yeah, I really am interested in all artwork. I mean, there are people that, um, you know, are more interesting to me, of course. Uh, I, you know, like Romare Bearden and the Astor Gates and um, uh, Hannah Hawk. So, uh, there are lots of influences, but I generally like artwork, um, 
period. I mean, I try to go to every museum in every city that I'm in. And um, I jured uh, in um, high school artwork for uh, many years at one of our high schools in um, Wisconsin. And I loved student work. So, um, you know, there are a lot of influences in terms of artists, but also in terms of everyday work and people who are around me and the things that I see. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's lovely. Um, that normal everyday people, not necessarily art superstars, mm -hmm. influence you as well. That's lovely. Yeah. Terrific, terrific. Well, it's I, I love that you're you know an educator and you've had a lot of experience because of course we are considered a campus of the College of Central Florida, and we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit more of that later. But um, now, how long were you a, a professor again, please? Oh, I taught. Um, I was adjunct professor, so it was about five years, I think. That's wonderful because I would mm -hmm. I would think to some extent that would give your artwork other influences and other potential ideas as well. Is that correct? Um, yes, in a way, but um, I taught very basic beginner students. So it was a little, <laughs> a little different. Um, but um, yeah, that's, yeah, not necessarily, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. No problem. That's that's yeah. terrific. Well, let's take a look at some of your wonderful work. So let me get this up real quickly. So could you tell us a little bit about this piece? Okay, I'm not seeing it. Oops, is it not up? Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, I just wanted to share this because people always wonder how I create my fabric. So this really is not a quilt. It is a piece that um, is about five feet by seven feet. And um, uh, it is silk screen and uh, painted and um, it's acrylic paint silk screen. And I really, kind of mass produce these large pieces. And then I will go back and rip and tear and use these in uh, some of my collage work. So this is just one of, I think when I did this particular uh, series, I may have um, made about six or seven of these large pieces and um, so it is really an example. It is not a completed uh, piece, but I suppose I could have quilted it and it would have been complete. But, yeah. Well, and you have a detail here so we can look a little more closely at may, perhaps mm -hmm. what, when you said you break them up into smaller pieces, maybe perhaps something like this. Yes. So it, it's layer upon layer upon layer of, um, uh, designs that I made. So I'm not using someone else's uh, patterns. I'm actually making my own silk screens in this case, um, silk screen and paint on the fabric. That's terrific. I, the layering is one of the things I like most about your art. It's just, it's, it's very easy to sort of enter into it and just mm -hmm. have fun walking about, if you will, visually in your work. Do you, do you feel that's part of the graphic design element as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. It's very, it's very great. Okay, so let's look at another one. Very colorful. Yes. This is a series that I did a series of 10 of these uh, painted portrait pieces. And um, the inspiration was um, I, as a kid, collected comic strips and read a lot of comic books. And as an adult, I collected African fabrics. So, um, and then I went to see the Black Panther movie. And when I left that movie, I came out of it um, invigorated and um, 
just thinking about Afrofuturism. And I knew at that point that I was going to make a series that sort of um, uh, made me think when I looked back about that movie. So um, I, you know, thought about it for a few weeks and then I painted the 10 portraits and I um, used this African fabric, which I collected and um, used that as a border. And it was interesting to me because I, for me, the central figure is about storytelling, which is, was the Marvel comics, uh, Black Panther. And then the border fabric is also about storytelling because African women often weave um, stories around um, the fabrics that they use, the uh, designs in the fabric. So it's sort of like incorporating um, storytelling from the future, which it will be, and then from the past. So that was uh, how the Painted Portrait series came about. I love that storytelling from the future and from the past. That's very mm -hmm. cool. And of course, very colorful and vibrant, which is going to be a little bit different from our uh, other pieces of yours that we're going to see in a bit as well. And I want to talk about that with you when we get there. Now, these are wonderful because you don't always quilt and you don't always work on fabric. <laughs> that is correct. I um, do, um, I paint um, my collages, I make collages and I paint on uh, paper and different uh, fabrics. I also paint on fabrics, but in this case, it is ink and um, uh, acrylic paint on uh, vintage paper. And the process is similar for me, at least when um, I'm making my uh, collage quilts, but um, it is an example of me uh, working with uh, paper. So I love doing these collage pieces. And it looks like you have bits of maybe an envelope and is this a stamp? It is a vintage stamp. I, I used to be an antique dealer oh. and um, I actually collected thousands of uh, uh, paper pieces and old love letters and architectural uh, maps and designs. So I used a lot of those in the um, pieces that I did in this particular uh, series. That's wonderful. Another piece that's ink on vintage paper. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, uh, you know, uh, sort of feel I used uh, the vintage paper and uh, uh, it's paint and pencil, um, so. One of the things I like about these works is your composition is really interesting and it it very cleverly, you I can tell you were studying this intensely because it really guides your eye around. My eye at least goes first to the face and then kind of bounces up to that large black linear bit mm -hmm. at, the, at the upper, at the upper left and then you know and then I just kind of bounce around and I think it's the same with the other one as well it's does it take you a long time to kind of place these or is it really more spontaneous um you know sometimes it's spontaneous and other times I place them and walk uh, away from them and come back and change them a little bit these this particular uh series I had um my husband's mom lived in Gary, Indiana. And I went to Gary and took hundreds of um, photos of some of the burnt out buildings and some of the homes that were, you know, dilapidated and falling apart. So I used some of the papers that had um, the vintage papers that were about mortgage and bills and uh, receipts. And um, I came up with you know, the patterns and the designs that I used for these particular, um, this particular series. Okay, yeah, they're really great. Now, they're not, they're not enormously large. Have you ever been no. tempted to do a really big one? 
Um, it depends on what you mean by really big. I've done like 32 by 24. So, you know, I've done pieces that are much larger than this. I did not send you one of the larger ones, but yes, I did a series called Fake News, actually. And a lot of those pieces are um, pretty large. So I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you too, um, did, did you do ink, your ink and mixed media work first or did you do your quilting first or was it kind of simultaneous in um, your career? It, yeah, um, I would say simultaneous um, because I started with the, uh, I, I did quilting, but I was also, um, you know, painting and doing collage on paper. So, and and then if there was the photography, which uh, I was um, doing. So it really is, you know, three or four processes that are sort of combined when I'm making a report and that I'm thinking about it. Okay, okay. Let's look at another piece. Now, these are very interesting as well. These are your black eyed peas, and I think everyone will love to hear about these. Well, the black eyed peas have sort of taken on a life of their own. I actually started these, I think it might have been in 2015 or a little before. But what happened, I had offcuts or remnants of the fabric that I was using in my larger pieces. And um, I, I was sort of keeping them in bags. And then eventually I decided they were just in the way. So I threw these bags away of all of this fabric. And um, I told myself, you shouldn't throw these away. You should keep them and use them for something. So I went to the African uh, museum in um, DC, not the African American Museum, but the African Museum. And one of the um, uh, cases that they had, there was an old African doll made of fabric. And um, I really liked the look of it. And it reminded me of, uh, you know, my ancestors and it always, you know, sort of resonated with me that particular piece. So um, when I got home, I decided to um, design a doll. So I played around with a few models until I came up with uh, a design that I liked. And from there, I started using all of my remnants of fabric. Um, on these dolls. So some of them have silk screen pieces or painted pieces and just, you know, all sorts of things. They're all uh, one of a kind and um, uh, they're signed and dated on the back. And I, I was making them and I would just put them in a container and I did nothing with them for a couple of years. And I eventually got like 125 of them. And um, they were shown at a gallery in a show as one piece, but they were sold individually. And now I have, I think I've made like a couple hundred of pieces. Most of them have sold, but there are a few that are sort of uh, floating around. So, and, you know, I'm on Instagram and people will every now and then contact me and say that you know, I have one of your black IP dolls and I look at it all the time and I'm, it wants to say hello to you. So it's sort of, you know, taken on this life and um, I enjoy it. And I enjoy hearing from the people who have, uh, you know, bought dolls. Do you name them? I do not name them. I number them. So each one is numbered on the back. Um, but no, I don't name them. I, I bet you the, the people that, that acquire them do. <laughs> they probably do. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I love this detail shot because it's it you can very clearly see what you were just describing, how these are bits and pieces of other works of yours. We've got these flower forms showing up in the middle on one leg, and you see that again over here on an arm. You've got this fabulous chicken, and then you've got some kind of almost um, West African looking images here. So it's really fun to see these so up close this is a wonderful um slide because i think it really and and the other thing about them and i know this because i make them but i can really almost tell uh when they were made because of the fabrics that are in them so if i'm doing die discharge for example then most of the dolls out of that series would be die discharge and these of course were um have silk screen in them. So it's very interesting. If you lay them together, you can almost see the progression of my uh, uh, work, my textile work. That's wonderful. That's very cool. So let's show the impact. And of course, they're very impactful on their own, but also let's look at the impact when they are shown like this. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is when they were um, in a show together. And they are about, 18 inches long by eight inches wide and about two and a half inches the depth. So they look tiny on there, but actually the uh, it was pretty impressive hanging in the gallery. Yeah, it's it's very impactful with the group like that. It's wonderful. Where was this? at the Portrait Society Gallery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Wonderful, it's very nice. So let's talk about some of your recent work, very recent work. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I really like about your art as well is you don't shy away from topics that can be considered difficult. Um, We had some pieces in the show that we had at the Appleton um, a couple of years ago when we were very pleased to have your show there. And it talked about incarceration of young black males and things like that. So let's talk a little bit about this piece, please. Yeah, this piece uh, was made in uh, 2020. And um, for me, I think of uh, 2020 as being the year of politics, uh, protest, and pandemic. So I made this series um, in the midst of the pandemic and and protests, protests in uh, my neighborhood, in the city that I lived in uh, when the pandemic was raging and um, it was very telling and significant. And I want to make sure that the people in power are not always the people who are telling the story. I think the story needs to be told by other people um, and uh, told by the disenfranchised. So that's very important uh, to me. Um, so I created the series and I, I had five of them. I think there's like this one is left, which is my favorite. So I've kept in my collection, but I also, um, created a piece, uh, kind of similar to this, but it is, um, it was like six feet by eight feet, I think. And um, it's called Portrait of Resilience. And that piece was uh, acquired by the um, Smithsonian. Congratulations. That is just wonderful. And this piece is fantastic. It's just really great. One of the things too, um, you've kind of already mentioned this because clearly you were working during the pandemic, during the various lockdowns and things that happened. Do you feel, I have asked everybody in the series this, do you feel that you were perhaps more busy creating art about the same? Some people, because it's interesting, because some people just sort of shut down 
and didn't needed to care for themselves and didn't want to make art. Other people's made art like crazy, and yet others it was about the same. Where would you mm -hmm. fall? Um, I think I uh, probably made more art than normal. I had all of these ideas uh, floating in my head. I was watching the news and I wanted to document um, what was happening and I wanted to document it um, through the way I felt at the time. I think even going back now and making a piece uh, it would be maybe different than it is now, but um, by me making it at the time, I think it um, definitely helped. So I was like, fast forward. I'm just, I'm working at full speed ahead. And I was at home. I have a home studio anyway, but, um, and I rise very early in the morning. So, you know, I'm like a four o'clock person in the morning, but um, when I was working on this series, seriously, I could just do it and not get any sleep, so. Okay, thank you for that. Another mm -hmm. thing I wanted to touch on as well, we've seen this throughout your work thus far, and of course, this is no exception. Obviously, you are very drawn to the human face. Mm -hmm. What does one's countenance, what does that mean to you? Does it symbolize something particularly? Um, I always think when I uh, do the human face or when I'm painting it, I always look at people in crowds and I always think about what they think about. I'm wondering what they think about, um, how they feel, um, I wonder if they have a face that is might be familiar. Is that an ancestor's face or, you know, so I'm, um, um, I like urban life and like I go to Chicago a lot and I'm walking down the street and I like the noise and the clatter and looking at all of these people in a flash, you know, when they just pass by. And I think I try to capture those faces in um, a lot of work that I do. And um, I started with the black faces because I uh, could not find black faces in fabric that I wanted. So I uh, started to design my own uh, faces. I see, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's clearly a strong piece of your work. Let's move on to, now these are a departure. As I was saying earlier, you have very colorful work and then you have these more subdued color wise mm -hmm. pieces. Now I've got the step-by-step, -step, but if you could kind of touch on how the difference, why you sort of do both. Cause I don't, I don't think there's a big progression you haven't really left these behind have you and moved to the bright you kind of always did the same didn't you uh yeah no I have not left these behind at all um and I would have to say in terms of my signature work this color is more of uh my signature work I don't do a lot of color like in the portrait uh pieces so um, I'm definitely in the more of the earth tones, I think, in terms of the messages that I'm trying to get across. It just uh, works. And it actually is a throwback to uh, the fact that I liked archaeology. So cave paintings and those types of things. Um, uh, I can tell in my work, you know, it sort of reminds me of that. But yeah, this is definitely more my uh, signature color. And um, you want me to talk about locks for a little bit? Well, sure, because I, I there's a lot, there's some serious iconography going on in here, which mm -hmm. is my beloved thing. So please enlighten us. Um, yeah, locks is a piece, it is a whole cloth quilt as opposed to some of the, um, pieces that are more collage that I do. So it's a whole cloth piece. And 
Um, in 2010, um, Madam C.J. Walker, it was the 100th anniversary of Madam C.J. Walker's uh, um, hair business. So um, I wanted to really uh, do something that sort of incorporated hair and gave a nod to Madam C.J. Walker. Um, she was an African-American entrepreneur, one of the uh, first self-made millionaire uh, Black women in the United States and trained many Black women in hair care products and the like. So I looked at ads from the 1910s when she was um, in uh, business, when she started in business, and I compared it to um, 2010 ads of uh, hair care products for African-American women. And the difference, uh, Madam C.J. Walker did a lot of um, uh, natural hair care products and uh, worked with natural hair. And then by 2010, um, we were looking at uh, hair that was permed and chemicals put in it and um, sort of hair fusion and extent, uh, extension. So there's a big difference in that 100 year process. Now, if I was doing it now in 2021, 20, uh, it would be different still because we moved back to um, natural hair care products. So really, you know, we've seen uh, the move away from Madam C.J. Walker and uh, uh, moving back towards uh, what she was espousing in um, 1910. So that is, you know, what lots. And this piece was, um, it's in the collection of the Museum of Wisconsin Art in Milwaukee, well, in yeah, West Bend. It, it's beautiful. I apologize if you start hearing my name. My neighbor chose this particular time to mow his lawn. So if you hear a very loud lawnmower, I apologize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like also that, of course, locks means hair, but you have the keys as in key and lock. I think mm -hmm. that's extremely clever. Um, of course, yeah. you know, there's the, there's the whole good hair thing that you hear about so mm -hmm. there's a lot of layers besides the layers that you actually have there's another there's a lot of psychological layers to this piece too it's just a fabulous piece thank you i really love it and one of the things i wanted to touch on too we're going to see more of this but um correct me if i'm wrong but i have heard that you're also influenced by west african art and i see that very clearly in your treatment of the figure here yes yes i am yeah it's just beautiful so let's talk a little bit about how you get this glorious color mm -hmm. i know you don't you don't necessarily tie this into Melian mud cloth. I know that you told me that, but I, I personally just, I see that kind of influencing a wee bit too, because mm -hmm. in addition to the cave paintings, which makes perfect sense. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about your process and I'll go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Well, there are several processes that I use. There isn't one in particular. Uh, what you are showing now are um, old metal pieces that I use when I am um, doing um, rusted fabric. So um, can you go to the next? Okay. So this is an, an example of some of the fabrics that I have um, rusted. So I use a chemical process that involves um, uh, vinegar and uh, salt. And I take old metal instruments and wrap them in cloth. And you can actually imprint on the fabric, the designs that are on the, um, the metal pieces. And uh, fortunately for me, um, I, my mom lives next to a uh, person who collects 
every kind of metal rusted object you can think of is in his yard. And I'm allowed to just go in there and use any of these uh, metal pieces. So I must have made, you know, 50 to 60 yards of this uh, fabric. And it is very labor intensive, at least the way that I do it, it is. You can do, you know, one yard or two yards, but I made uh, lots of uh, yardage. So that is one of the methods that I use to um, uh, make the, uh, put the color in fabric. And it, it's a lot more to it. I mean, the metal flecks are on some of the fabric, so it can be difficult to sew through. Um, yeah, so. So how long does it take when you when you immerse the cloth in the rusted metal object in this mm -hmm. bath? How long does it take? Um, I left these pieces, I would say, from five to seven days. Okay. Now, does it being um, in the sun help? It does, uh, being in the sun, but it dries the fabric out quicker. So then you have to go back and keep, uh, you know, wetting it. It's not a process that you can do indoors. And I always did it when I was in Florida. I, uh, so I could do it outdoors. Mm. And then I, I actually stopped because one of the pots had a snake in it when I went to uh, do it and that ended it. So. Oh dear. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> so after it's, they're done and they're dried, this is the gorgeous after effect. and. It's just so rich. It's just lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I have stacks and stacks of it, so much so that I have started giving it away. Wow. I don't think I will ever use it all. Wow. Yeah. So do you go to, I would assume you do, but do you go to some of this with an absolute plan in mind? Like I'm going to put the imprint of a wrench because I'm going to play on this particular theme that I'm working on? Um, not when I design, designed this. Well, uh, sometimes I did. Like if I knew I needed a particular area and I wanted that piece to be an oval shape, for an example, I would pick something that had that shape and I knew where it was going to go. But generally for this fabric, I just uh, designed it and uh, rusted it all. And then I can remember what's on all of the pieces. So I know when I'm making something, you know, oh yeah, I have a piece and I'll go back and get it. And then once this is rusted, I can also dye it and um, I paint on it. I even put paint on it while it is rusting. So it isn't just one layer of uh, uh, one process. There are several processes that uh, are involved. Okay. And then you can get something like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is the piece that we own at the Appleton Museum of Art, Woman with mm -hmm. Roosters. And I love it. Thank you. Um, a little bit about the roosters. Um, the roosters, are a symbol of never giving up. And uh, I think the central figure for me, being an African-American woman, is a symbol of uh, never giving up and um, persistence. And I also think of it as um, just Mother Earth and new beginnings and the dawn of a new world when I think of the roosters and the, the crowing and just the beginning. So um, yeah, that piece is, uh, I love this piece actually. Oh, okay, so, good. And I'm I so happy it. to do that. <laughs> and I will tell you, I am so happy that um, this piece is in Florida. I'm glad because I was, you know, I'm a Floridian. I was born in Miami. So it means a lot to me that um, 
uh, some of my work ends up in theory. Oh, thank you. That that makes it that much more wonderful. Um, everyone, I want to tell you all, it is on view. It is currently on view. So you may come to the museum if you are able and see this beautiful piece in person. And it is just stunning. And another thing I really like about it too, for me, it encompasses a lot of your, the different styles and themes of York. So to me, the central figure is has definite um, West African overtones. She has the neck rings, which are a marker of beauty mm -hmm. in certain West African cultures. Um, you know, uh, this the rooster, as you said, new dawns, never gives up. But it's also a marker to to a lot of extent of the southern United States. Yes. Um, you know, so I think to me, it's got a lot of all the wonderful things you do in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's that's why I love it. So please all do come see. So let's stop. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this piece before I stop sharing? Um, no, I'm. OK, so I'll stop uh -huh. sharing and go back to our faces. So as I mentioned earlier, we are a campus of the College of Central Florida. And one of the things I always like to ask each artist as well is for those individuals who are emerging artists or are student artists, do you have advice or words of wisdom for them? Oh, I always tell emerging artists that um, they should work every day on their artwork, um, come up with uh, an area that they enjoy working on, and uh, be persistent and um, be professional in what they do and um, just stick with it. It takes a long time. I mean, there are very few people who just, you know, the first piece is, uh, oh my gosh, you know, it takes years of work. And, um, you know, I think it, it happens for you. You just have to stick with it. Great, thank yeah. you for those words of wisdom. So I'm going to go to the chat and see if people have written any questions. We encourage you all that are watching to please ask questions if you have any in the chat. Oh, I, that's surprising, I'm not seeing any. We did such a good job, Sharon, we don't have any questions yet. <laughs> Um, any of you who would like to ask questions, something we didn't cover, something that you've always wanted to know, because I know several of you who are watching this are very familiar with this piece at the Appleton. So if there's a question about Woman with Roosters that you've always wanted to know, now is your time. So we'd love to hear from you if you have any questions at all. Another thing that I think is really interesting about your work too, um, you mentioned that you are fond of cities and fond of the hustle and bustle and all the excitement. One of the things you said you were also influenced by that we really haven't touched on very much this evening at all is the Harlem jazz scene. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, um, I listen to a lot of uh, jazz music when I am uh, working. And I, um, I can feel and see rhythms and uh, designs and fabric when I am uh, creating the work. So I can see the influences of uh, sort of abstract uh, ideas in jazz. And um, I, you know, I like to translate that into uh, the work that I am uh, working on at the time, the things that I'm doing uh, at the time. That makes a lot of sense because some of your pieces I see real syncopation in mm -hmm. the imagery. So mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense. Well, gosh, everyone's being shy this evening. We just don't have a lot of questions. Oh, here's one. Oh, good. <laughs> Earl 
comments that it appears as if some of the center panel segments are quilted, but not the borders. Is that correct? And is it, it is hard to see the depth of field on the computer? Uh, no, that is not correct. They are painted, I mean, uh, quilted. The borders are quilted and the actual painted uh, portraits are quilted. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for, for Sharon? Um, yeah, we, let's reiterate, you, you slipped it in very subtly, but I would like to reiterate your, your big news, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, one of my pieces was acquired by the Smithsonian, the Renwick Gallery, Smithsonian um, Museum of Art. And it is one of the 2020 pieces that, um, is about protest and pandemic and politics. Um, so it will be, uh, they are having their 50th anniversary in next year, 2022. So it will be uh, a part of that. And in a, they have a catalog of all of the pieces. So uh, yeah. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, one person, not a question, but a comment. Suzanne says, I really love the energy of your work. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> well, gosh, I guess everybody's just going to be shy this evening. Um, is there anything else, any other wisdom you wanted to impart before, <laughs> we, <laughs> before we wrap it up this evening? Oh, nothing that I can think of, um, you know, I have some new pieces that I'm working on. I can talk about that a little bit. Um, you sure. don't, I didn't give you slides of them. I have uh, uh, some large black and white uh, quilts that I'm working on. They're all painted, hand painted. Um, and I have like five in that series. Well, I have four because one, was recently acquired. Um, and um, I'm also uh, incorporating uh, my painted work in with the dye discharge quilt. So, quilt. So, I have some pieces that I'm working on, which will have uh, both of those uh, techniques in it. And so far, they're very interesting. I'm enjoying working on them and uh, I like them. A lot. That sounds great. I can't look mm -hmm. forward to seeing those. We did get a question pop up quickly. Um, Emily asked whether you prefer one medium or another in the two, well, the several mediums that you work. Um, no, I don't prefer one. I, I don't prefer one over the other. I do more textile uh, work uh, than I do any thing else but um you know I love to paint I like photography and um, um you know I do them as often as I can I, I tend to work in series so if I'm doing uh works on paper then you know I do a series of those and if I'm doing a uh, textile work or whatever it may be at the time I will do a series of uh that so Perfect. that's terrific. Um, I, I had a question in my head and it absolutely just flood. I apologize. <laughs> uh, one of the things too um, that I think is really interesting is uh, I'm trying to think of how to say this. You know, quilt, quilting has traditionally been thought of as women's work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very interesting how you incorporate these very modern progressive themes and, and sometimes looking back, of course, as well in this very old and his history and marvelous medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. And it is true about 
quilting and uh, women's work. I will tell you that when I am creating my art, I am thinking about art, I'm thinking about the process, I'm thinking about um, the idea that I'm trying to get across. And I don't really um, think about any of the other uh, questionable things that you know people do. I show most of my work is shown in uh, galleries and uh, museum settings. So I, I just go with it and, you know, people accept it. And, and I think of course, uh, with uh, Bisa Butler and some of the other, uh, Basil Kincaid and some of the other uh, quilters who are working now, uh, textiles and quilts are becoming much more acceptable in the um, in the art world. Mm -hmm. I agree wholeheartedly, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, it's funny because I tried to, as we were speaking, I was trying to imagine some of the your quilted pieces not being textiles. And mm -hmm. I think the textile, adds so much more to it there's so many much so much more layering both figuratively and literally to that that I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it not being a textile I guess maybe because I'm just familiar with your work and mm -hmm. I see our beautiful woman with rooster so often mm -hmm. so that's yeah it's interesting aside <laughs> Well, I want to thank you. I'm going to um, invite everybody uh, to please, again, come to the Appleton and see Woman with Roosters. It is currently on view on the second floor, and we'd love to have you. I also wanted to mention quickly that the next, this is a series, those of you who may be new to this and have not experienced the, art, the other artist outlooks so far, this is an ongoing series that I've been conducting for quite a while now. It does conclude at, in, at the end of December. So we'll have a December Artist Outlook and then it is set to conclude. So we have a few more artists coming up. It is a monthly thing, traditionally um, the third Thursday of the month, but sometimes with holidays and such, we do change it. The next one is Thursday, October 21st. And the artist I will be interviewing is David Williams. He's another Florida artist. He's in our permanent collection as well. And he kind of is self-described as a contemporary mixed media artist. He has a lot of pop references, but he doesn't consider himself a pop artist. He also has a lot of um, mid-century imagery uh, from advertisements you know, the iconic Howard Johnson's eating pancakes kids, you know, things like that are integrated into his art artwork as well. And it's often very clever as well. He does plays on words and sometimes sort of a nod and a wink in his art. So it's great fun. So I invite you to please come to the next one. Also, I wanted to briefly mention, we do record these. So if you have a friend or a family member that couldn't make it to watch this tonight, they are on the Appleton Museum of Art YouTube channel. So all of the ones that we have done, including tonight's, will be up on the YouTube channel for you to go back and enjoy or send to friends if they would like to see it as well. So Sharon, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. As you know, I'm a big fan. I love your artwork. And we just really are grateful to have you. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And one last thing, um, if anyone is interested in more information about me, they can visit my website, which is SharonCarryHarlan.com. I have uh, a bio and an artist statement, which goes into a little more depth of uh, uh, my background and what I'm doing now. Thank you. Yes. And we just put it in the chat as well for those of you who are following the chat so you can jot that down quickly as well. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. Well, thank you again, Sharon. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We are so grateful to have you. We really appreciate your support. You are what makes this possible. So thank you for tuning in. And I hope you have a lovely evening. Until next time. Good night. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye.